Stoffman Show. We're on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app and streaming live on YouTube at the Team 980. It's Friday. Hell yeah. Uh, and that means Clinton Yates is with us. What's up, dude? What's going on, man? How have you been this week? What's new? Uh, this week, honestly, has been weird because we've been in such this pressure cooker leading up to the draft. And then all of a sudden the pressure released and we're like, oh, what else is going on? It's like you stick your head up out of the, the, the war trench. And, and here we are. There's playoffs happening. There's players that have been selected. People like most of them. It's weird. Very odd feeling this time of year to have hope in uh many regards on the gridiron so that's that's pretty cool you were there you you went right yes also yes catching my breath literally from the travel and just the the slog of uh, endless like look i'm not complaining um i'm I'm, like this is a great gig i get to talk about football and other stuff uh but like it is a lot it was a very intense uh couple of weeks so yeah getting back from detroit last week and uh you know kind of catching my breath from all that yeah it's uh it's been nice it's we had a we had a good week here on the show how's uh how's 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 espn daily been this week things are good i just got through talking to my man justin tinsley who if you're not familiar with his work wrote an entire book about biggie smalls the notorious big and he's got a story out today called the quiet king of new york referring to jalen brunson and if you know anything about hip-hop gangster movies those linkages are very important in the sports psyche of new york city so go check that out at anscape nice uh so we'll talk about brunson and the nick sixer series uh here in a few minutes as that's uh wrapped up with more heroics from him last night uh but i want to start uh talking about a topic that you and i have actually talked about quite a bit over the last year as dion has gone to colorado and there's been varying stories that have popped up uh, that that have been topics of discussion and shows like this. And The Athletic put out this story this week, which kind of sparked all of the recent round of prime discussion, where they profiled a lot of the players who have left and, and in fact, tracked them, which was the first time anyone had really done that. And there's then kind of the, the circle of reaction where Dion and his son are, you know, at and dudes on Twitter, including some of the former players. And, uh, you know, people are getting takes off. That's as much setup as I'm going to give. I don't want to lead you in any direction. What's what's your reaction to this latest round of Deion Sanders' story? There's a couple things here at play. Number one of which is I commend The Athletic for this journalistic route. Following guys who are arguably a part of the most famous transfer class in the history of college football just makes sense from a storytelling standpoint. However, I would be really interested to see, in addition, if you did this for every, let's just say, Power 4 program, what kind of a readout would you get on said head coach? And I say all that to set this point up. Getting crapped on as a player is a fundamental part of what college football is, whether we like it or not. You can go back to guys yelling things like, it's Division One football. If you don't like it, play in the murals, brother, or whatever. And like the cutthroat nature of how the game operates at that level is not particular to Dion. I need people to understand that. However, when you add the Sanders element in terms of everything happening in front of cameras, everything happening on social media, everybody knowing who you are, even though you are not necessarily a big time player, well then once that's bisected with the Gen Z element, you've got yourself an actual problem. And a reason And the reason I think you've got yourself an actual problem, Craig, is not just because it's unbecoming in some people's minds, not because people think it should be beneath him to be out here, John, with guys on the bird like I was 10 years ago, you know what I'm saying, sitting in a newsroom, but because it doesn't help. And that's really a big thing. I feel like the modern athlete looks at a situation like Colorado's, and I'm not using Colorado specifically. I could use this as a proxy for many schools, coaches who think they're a big deal, who have programs on the rise that are very visible as a result of God knows what recently in their history. And players say, I'm not dealing with that. If I'm not necessarily definitively going to play on Sundays, or if I don't particularly care to have my ego destroyed, I'm just not doing it. So while I do think there is a certain level of showmanship and a lack of diplomacy in what him and Shador have been doing, I ultimately think the largest problem, if I'm a Buffaloes fan, is that, yo, you don't know who you're turning away with this type of approach as far as other recruits are concerned that might have considered being a part of the Buffaloes program. 
So I'm not a Buffalo's fan. Um, particularly, like I'm not not a fan, right? But like I look at this, no, I get it. Um, not through the lens of like what's best for Colorado football, which is why the first thing you said is exactly where I landed as well. Which is this is not a new problem, but it is a problem. In fact, Deion Sanders, revolutionary rebel Deion Sanders, has now acted like so many other problematic college football coaches, and it is the fundamental problem with college sports. People involved seem to forget who the, who the children and who the adults are. And there should be some responsibility incumbent on the adults, which in this case is Deion Sanders as the, what is he, in his 50s-year-old uh, coach of a program. And by the way, the athletic director and the school president and the other folks at Colorado around them to act like adults when 20-year-olds act like 20-year-olds. Like, we're old enough to know that 20 years old you're old enough to know a lot of things, but you're not that old. You are still very much a child. And the 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 childish or the childishness, if you will, of like Dion and some other folks at Colorado that are supposed to be adults, to me, like that's where the problem is. And that it, that's why like Dion, I I think has made a huge mistake here and is in the wrong here is because if the kids want to say stuff, they're kids. You're Dion Sanders. You're a Hall of Famer. You're you. You're also an adult. Just Keep it moving forward, man. Don't get me wrong. This is not how I would run my program, proverbially. But I also do think that if all of the conversations that every head coach had with a kid that they were running out of their program was aired publicly, you might think poorly of a lot of different head coaches. Oh, and I only trust me, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? And your point, is, right. your point is well taken, which is that this is not a Dion problem, but if Dion is going to put himself in a position as being the one we gaze upon, then yeah, you're going to take a little bit more scrutiny for it. And so there's a couple more things at play here that I think do matter in this scenario that I think are easy to kind of forget. Number one, Colorado is moving from the Pac-12 to the Big 12. And that sounds like it doesn't matter, but I do think, there is a large element of Coach Prime here that's feeling a little pressure, way more so than anything that existed beforehand. You can't slide by with four wins these days. You can't come out and get dump trucked by four touchdowns by a bunch of conference opponents and expect people not to laugh at you in your face. I think they know as a program, they had 53 transfers coming in from the previous year to last. That was the most ever in NCAA history. They're in the 40s this year, Craig, because they moved from one win to four. They know they've got to get better, and they don't have any shame in that. Their bedside manner, if you will, probably not great with it, but I think there is a legitimate competitive pressure that is changing the outward communicative way that Prime is approaching this, and I think that probably – he might not even realize that as much as anybody because he's never been in this position in his life, even though he can pretty much do anything. Clint Yates with us on the Hoffman Show. And in six minutes, we've gotten to the core crux of what I think is the issue, like the fundamental question here, which is in college sports, given that they are college kids going to college, how much does winning or how much should winning matter? Not that we no. shouldn't try to lose, but like, what do we prioritize? Do we prioritize the winning or if a kid committed to your school with the intention of going there and say the kid's been there one or two years and has made a bunch of friends and likes being a Colorado student, like how seriously are we going to take the student athlete thing? And I'm asking that in a genuine way, not as in like an old curmudgeonly like, oh, they're supposed to be students. But like there is an element to like these are young people that we are disrupting their lives over wins of foot like winning and losing football games. And if, if a guy, that doesn't mean he has to play. It doesn't mean Dion has to give him snaps and minutes and the whole deal. But at the end of the day, like if a kid says, hey, I like really like it here. I've got a great support group. I've got friends I like. I like my major. I like my professors. Like I'm, I'm on to something and I'm not a guy who's going to play in the NFL anyway. Like that dude should get to stay at the end of the roster. And like I, I just, that's like a fundamental thing for me. And the the ruthlessness and the cutthroatness, and again, this is not a Dion problem. This is a college football problem sure. that is being shown through Dion taking it as far as anyone's ever taken it. Because you just mentioned these are record number of transfers, but like that to me is at the core of the fundamental thing here that we're talking about is like what are we actually valuing in college sports while acknowledging it's also a billion dollar business that relies on the competition. 
This is the question I tried to answer when I was there at the end of the season last year for a couple games. When I was there at the beginning of the season for a couple games, it was more so, oh my God, what are we looking at? This is fantastic. Towards the end of the season, it was very different. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the old guy. Oh, they must be student athletes. Well, there's another old guy stance that is also very prevalent, but is on the opposite side of the coin, which is win at all costs. And I think that Colorado was still trying to figure that out, as is Dion. I'm with you, Gregory. If you create an experience where people just plain like being there, a la the 27,000 who showed up in the rain to watch a glorified practice at Folsom Field, a 100-year-old facility, on some level, you've already won because people caring in Boulder at all is the victory. Now, the outside pressures in order to rack up wins so that people can look at you and say, oh, wow, they've actually got some trophies. That's a different matter. Let us not forget. Colorado is a school with actual national championships. The humans that played on those teams are around. One of those humans played on the Washington football team and is very well known. Excuse me. Um, and so in general, it's just kind of like they still have to figure that out for themselves. What doesn't help? is pissing people off in the interim by doing things like unnecessarily shaming guys in public. I just don't think it helps. I don't have a huge issue with it. If I was a parent, I'd probably feel pretty differently about it, but it's garden variety, college football chicanery. It just happens to be happening on the public stage. Well, and that, that is the last part of this, right? Is like, if you're going to go and talk about how you're taking care of kids and some of the stuff that Dion says, and you're tweeting out Jesus quotes every morning. And like, you want to be that guy. Like I, I'm, if I'm a parent of a kid who's on the receiving end of this, I'm calling him and be like, Hey, I'm, I'm an adult here. You're an adult here. Why'd you treat my kid like this? Like you, t- you told me, or you took over for a coach that told me that you would take care of my kid. Like that's what every recruiting pitch is. And so to hear some of the stories, and, and again, like to be very clear, I, I think what you said off the top is true. If you did this kind of story at almost any school, you'd get versions of this. But mm-hmm. if you don't even have a personal relationship with players, and I realize it's hard with 100 guys, but like the first one-on-one conversation you have is to be like, you suck, leave. Like, what are we doing there? Like, that's just, yeah. it's no way to be. And, and at some point, I, I mean, I used to, here's a, this is like a personal thing, but like it's what actually used to grind my gears about Bayheim at Syracuse. Like mm. he treated student reporters poorly for sport on purpose. And I'm like, you're employed by the university. And I realize that I have a press credential right now, or my colleague has, I was never thankfully on the receiving end of one of those, but like I had, I had friends who were, and it's like, we are students right now. Are we going to nail this? No, we're students, but you work here. Like you're actually, in many cases, the highest paid employee of said academic institution of higher learning. You have a responsibility to not be bad to the students. And while we're still in this model where the 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 student or the uh, the student and the athlete are tied together, I think that responsibility still exists. If you want to make some some other minor league fo- football, fine, but it's still college football, and like there has we have to at least pretend. I totally agree. And on top of that, don't think that the pressure from within the university isn't going to become very real very soon. The person I was referring to that has played in the city within which you broadcast is, of course, Michael Westbrook. And I talked to him. I remember after I can't remember which game it was after it was early off and it was early on in the season. And I said, you know, what are expectations? He said expectations. He says, bro, look up on the wall. I was on that team. The ceiling is right there. This is not some shot in the dark situation. People remember. And so I do think that from a performance standpoint, never mind a presentation one, there is going to be a lot more pressure this year on Dion. And quite frankly, I think that's a good thing. That's what makes this fun is that sometimes it's not just about whether or not you're winning and losing. It's about how everybody feels about it. And that's why we love sports. No doubt. Uh, Clint Yates with us here on the Hoffman Show. Quick break. Come back. Talk a little hoops uh, next on the Team 980. What's up, kiddos? It's your boy Clint Yates from ESPN. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. Tell your mama I said what's up.